Hi, welcome back to Vexhill West. Well, today's video is all about my first experiments in producing some 3D printed carriages. So in this video I thought I'd talk about some of my development work in designing and manufacturing some carriages for the Bexhill West project. Now this picture behind me here really is what started it all off and it shows the, the 19th of October 1958 when the Rother Valley Rail Tour visited Bexhill West on part of its whistle stop tour of the South East. Now I must confess here Upon seeing this photo initially I had no idea um, about railway carriages or some of the complexities around identifying them and certainly building them. But this picture here really is what started it all off and in particular the number that was visible on the end of this carriage. And so with nothing else to go on I did a Google search for that carriage number and that led me through an interesting process whereby I found some very useful websites um, and had some viewers actually recommend some books that I needed to read to kind of find out what I needed to know. And this video really is a, a look at the journey I've been on over the last few weeks in finding out some of the information that I've needed. Um, and as we work through this, I'll move on to show you some of my design work for the carriages that I'm going to need. And I'll talk through some of my first thoughts about the processes I'm going to use to build them. I'll show you some 3D prints. I'll discuss why I've chosen particular sort of print strategies that I've gone for. Um, and we'll talk about how the finished product might evolve. And hopefully there'll be some food for thought here. And I'm sure there's some very clever people on the internet who might even be able to give me some advice or point out some inaccuracies or errors that I'm making along the way. Anyway, let's get stuck into it. So then I knew from that last photo that that particular carriage, its number was 3674. And I also had this photograph which shows the same carriage, taken at almost exactly the same time, but looking from the end. And you could just make out on the end of the carriage of the numbers 951. Now I didn't realise this at the time, but the Southern Railways carriages were tended to be kept in sets. And the 951 is the number of that particular set. So I knew an individual carriage number and the number for the set. So with that information, I looked online to try and find out a little bit more about it and hopefully what the numbers of the rest of the carriages in that set would be. But it didn't take me long and I found this really excellent website and I'll, I'll put a screenshot up for you here. Um, and what somebody there has very helpfully done is collated all of the carriage numbers and the set numbers and put that into a, a big Excel sheet and you can download it and sort of do control F to find any particular number you want. So I searched for 951 and that gave me all of the carriages that made up set number 951. So that's a pretty good starting point. So once I'd found out the carriage numbers, I needed to find out what those carriages were. Were they brake thirds, first class, second class, etc. So I could look online and somebody recommended that I get this particular book. And in this book, it lists all of the carriage numbers, and importantly, and this was new to me, they're diagram numbers. And the diagram number relates to um, kind of like the floor plan of the carriage, and it shows all of the compartments, guards' compartments, corridors, um, lavatory compartments, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and from that you can kind of build up a picture of what each carriage certainly was like inside and of course that determines what's happening on the outside as well where the doors are and the, the windows and drop lights and things like that. So with that I was able to create a, a kind of a first and fairly crude set of drawings and I'll put those on the screen now. So then these were my first drawings that I was able to create using the information from Gould's book. We had a third class break seven compartment first and an eight compartment third coach. Now they were enough to complete the rake that I was after but whilst I was at it I thought I would draw up a first and third composite coach as well thinking that there's bound to be other trains that I would be able to make up if I get a complete set of coaches. So that was my starting point. 
Now then, at this point, I was recommended to get myself a copy of this book, An Illustrated History of Southern Coaches by Mike King. Now this is a really excellent book, and I think it covers just about any any sort of type of coach or whatever that you could possibly be interested in for um, Southern themed railways. And so this was really useful, um, and I'll turn to a, a couple of pictures in more detail in a minute. But coincidentally, when I got this book, I also was able to pick up this pamphlet. Now this pamphlet is the um, like the, the programme, if you like, of the Rother Valley Rail Tour. So this was what was issued to passengers on that rail tour in 1958. Now this is full of all sorts of really nice information, and I'll come to this in another video. But on the back of it, rather helpfully, is it actually has all of the coach numbers listed for me um, and the year they were built. Now this is quite important and we'll get onto that in just a minute. Uh, but what was interesting, when I compared the vehicle numbers for the carriages here, it, it, it was different to that on the spreadsheet which I've previously shown you. So it also told me the types of coaches and from that I could determine the diagram numbers. So I had to go back and re revisit my drawings. But that was fine because I now had this wonderful book which gave me all the information I needed to sort of fill the gaps. Now, one other thing that became clear from here was that there was also a Pullman car um, named Camilla which was made part of that train so we can, we'll talk about that probably in a separate video. Anyway that was all my basic information so to conclude then I knew that what I needed was a set of Monsol um, 59 foot coaches. So very basically this is what I've been after and Good news, in a sense, I've, I've got a set of these. This is exactly the type of coach that I'm after. However, there's a problem with them. And first problem, and this is minor, but now I've become a bit of a nerd, I'm gonna point it out. This number here, 273, denotes that this is a set from the Waterloo to the West of England routes. So that clearly won't do, but we could just paint it out. But there's another problem. And the problem relates to the history of the Southern Railway and when um, it was originally formed from all of the pre-grouping companies. And all the, the South East was littered with many different railway companies and they all had slightly different standards and as a consequence of this there were uh, route restrictions or clearance issues on different lines um, and notably the, the Hastings line when it was built it was reputed that the the tunnels were poorly constructed and they showed signs of failure upon opening the line so they had to actually line the inside of the the tunnels with another row of bricks and consequently the the ball, the diameter of the tunnels were reduced and so they couldn't run standard stock through them. As a consequence of this, when the, the, the southern carriages were all being built, they were built to different what was called restrictions. Now I'm sure most people watching this will know all about this, but I didn't know initially. Um, and basically the, the same carriages were built with different widths. So this one I believe would be a, a restriction for carriage which is kind of the full fat version and I don't know whether you'll be able to see this on the camera but there is a, a definite sort of tumble home to the side. The side of the carriage has a nice curved profile. Now that's, um, that's fine except the Bexhill West Branch came off of the Hastings line and as I've just said we've got these clearance issues through the tunnels and so what was required for the Hastings line was what was called restriction zero coaches and they were just over eight feet wide um, and tended to have vertical sides to the end. So if we look at this carriage here we can see that the brake end is actually narrower, there's like a swage line in the body and then the body widens out. So really what I'm after is a set of carriages with these kind of slab sides. Let me show you a picture in the book and it will hopefully make a bit more sense. So then this photograph shows something sort of exactly what we're after. Um, in fact, this photograph is taken in Hastings. 
um, but we can see that the, the sides of this coach are pretty much slab sided, pretty much vertical. There is the very slight tumble home on the bottom of the, the coach bodies, but scaled down to four millimeter scale. This is, this is tiny and we'll cover that when I look at my uh, design work for the coaches. But this is why, because we've got the carriages at this narrow, I can't use a commercial product. Now, there is a company that makes etched brass kits for these carriages and I and I emailed them and contacted them to get some more information but I haven't had a response so I thought why not have a go designing my own so I'll show you some of my design work and some of my first experiments of trying to recreate these things so with some good quality research material identified I then set about drawing up the carriages in 3D CAD now what I chose to do was divide the carriage into separate modules. So for example, the doors were standard width. Um, the panels with the drop lights in that look like doors, but aren't actually doors, they were standard width. Uh, the high window bays, standard width, etc., etc. So I drew each of those separate elements up um, to create kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Having done that, I was able to connect up the bits I needed to create the different carriages. So on screen here, we've got a break third. Um, and this is the, the drawing derived from the 3D model. And here is the 3D model, and we can kind of flip this around and look at it from all sorts of different angles. And so having worked out what it was I was trying to achieve, I then started to think about the strategies that I might use to create these things. Now, they are pretty much slab-sided. And my first thoughts were straightforward 3D prints. Um, and I tried that with just the tiniest little tumble home that they have on the bottom. And that tumble home was so small that it was insignificant. You, you couldn't really make it out. So I've decided to construct these things with perfectly flat sides. And if need be, I can just run a, a block of abrasive paper over the bottoms of the, the carriage sides and put that tumble home in by hand. Now, an obvious choice for, for making these things, given that they have flat sides, is to, to laser cut or use etched brass for the carriage construction. However, I started to think about this and, and I could well need lots and lots of these things. So for example, just for the Rother Valley Rail Tour, I'm gonna to need at least seven. Um, but if I want other trains to run to Bexhill West, particularly trains that are gonna to go to London, they're gonna to need to be the, the same restriction zero stock. So who knows, I might need 20, 30, 40 of these things. So the idea of going down an etched brass route or, or even laser cutting and fabricating them up, this is just going to take forever. So I thought, is there a way in which I could sort of speed that process up? And my kind of, I've drawn to casting them um, and producing moulds to do just that. And so my experiments with 3D printing have really been um, around how I might best create um, a set of moulds or set of tools that I could use to cast these things reliably, um, repeatably and hopefully quite economically. Now I say economically, there's still going to be some expense attached to it because my intention is to use the standard Hornby uh, Maunsell carriage underframes and bogies because they're simply so good they can't be repeated, you know, I can't make them as good. Um, so I shall be scouring the internet for second-hand Maunsell carriages to, to try and liberate their underframes. So my focus is entirely on building the bodies which will fit onto those underframes, which were exactly the same, whether it was restriction zero or restriction one or restriction two or four or whatever. Whatever restriction there was on these coaches, the underframes were the same. And so for me, the Hornby underframes, um, I think, will do. Now what I'm about to describe is going to seem like an awful lot of work, but with an etched brass kit being around about £80, and the fact that I, who knows I might need 30 of these things, that's, uh, that's nearly £2,500 in, in kits, not to mention the time and everything spent creating them. So I think it's well worth me investing a bit of time in coming up with a solution that might enable me to produce these things relatively quickly. Um, and whilst I don't imagine it's going to be cheap in terms of um, labour, I think the ultimate material cost could, per unit could be really quite cheap. So I'm, I think it's worth exploring this avenue before I get too bogged down to committing to spend lots of money that I'm sure is better purposed elsewhere. So let's get into it. So then this is my first print and I'm going to call this a total success, only in as much as 
its failures were entirely predictable and it has failed exactly how I thought it would. Um, but I wanted to kind of rule this method of construction out before I went and explored other avenues. So my idea here was could I just print the coaching sections up to the maximum length of my um, resin tank on my 3D printer. Um, and this works well where we've got an enclosed end, it's turned out to be quite rigid and what have you, but the inconsistency I think in the cross section around these areas on the open end has caused it to deform and this was despite having quite a, a closely controlled um, cure cycle. There's also been a bit of swelling in the centre of the carriage here. Now I could overcome most of these things by putting ribs in under the roof, that would work and, I, and, and I'm sure that would kind of work out okay. Um, but it's going to cause problems for me, it's going to make it difficult to glaze the inside of these, difficult to um, put the seats in and the partitions and everything else. Now something I'll mention here, and this applies to everything I'm going to show you, this is not the finished roof surface. My intention is to have a separate moulded roof that would clip over. But anyway, that was the first go. Not a total failure, in as much as it failed how I thought it would, but it meant I could sort of discount it. So the next thing I did, and I produced several of these um, sort of test pieces, and these really were to experiment with, and let's see if we can get this to focus a little bit better. It was to experiment here with how, what sort of relief and what sort of detail could I get into the surface of these things. So where the doors are, for example, the compartment doors, I needed to sort of create little grooves that would form the, the, sort of the door shut lines. Um, I haven't put the hinges on this one. There's these little louvre ventilators over the doors, for example. I, I experimented, produced several of these, experimenting with different levels of relief on them to kind of get it, funnily enough, out of scale. I have to sort of exaggerate these things to make them obvious so that you can see they're there. If they're all perfectly to scale, you just you can't even see it. Anyway, I've reasonably be pleased with these. I'll just point out some defects here. Um, these are these are defects in the print. This was printed with the bed sort of straight onto the bed of the, the resin printer. And so this final surface is formed by the surface of the film at the underneath of the resin tank. And my film's a bit worn out, but rather than replace it, I thought I'd do all my experiments. So we can see there's a uh, little marks in my film that have sort of telegraphed through onto these prints. And it's interesting, different prints have got exactly the same marks on. Anyway, reasonably pleased. These I've left on a, a window sill and they've developed a slight curve, which again is predictable. And it really is why I'm not keen on going down the road of 3D printing the final things, because these prints, they do seem to, they go brittle over time and, and regardless of how well you cure them, they do tend to, um, to sort of deform and stuff. Now, to, to an extent, this could be restricted or constrained by gluing this onto a base and stuff, but I, I thought I'd try and explore something a little bit different. So, what I'm going to do is put up on screen um, a, a, a 3D drawing which will show some of my tooling ideas, and I'll show you here a, a kind of what I mean. So this is the corridor side of that same break third coach. So it would go door, um, drop light, and they looked a bit like doors, but they weren't doors. So it went door, drop light, door, drop light, door. And what I've done on the reverse of here, there is a sort of a rebate around each of the windows into which I can put some glazing when this is all complete. I want the glazing to be sort of typically sort of fairly flush, just like the originals were. And so I'm very keen to form that, mould that detail in, rather than stick a piece of sort of clear material on the inside and having sort of too thick a window pillar. So what I've done is from my original drawing, I've created a male version of the, the female detail on the back. And the idea is that this will sort of press onto here and so my thinking is, I will, if I model this 
for, for like the whole of the coach and, not, and I'm going to do one side at a time. So I'm going to do one side of the coach like so and I'll have this screwed to a mandrel, probably a piece of aluminium bar or something. And then here's a coach end, now this is a whole end, I'll sort of have this cut down the middle. So I've just got half an end, a coach side and another half an end will sort of come on here something like this. Obviously the, it'll be the full length. And I'll set that up as a kind of a mandrel for my tool, over which I will install the 3D printed coach side. And then my plan is to form a little casting box, probably be upside down, something like that. So this will sit into a wooden box. And then I'll put my um, sort of rubber casting material, all the, pour it in all the way round, um, to create my female cavity, my, my tool. When that's all cured, I should be able to wiggle all of this out. I'll be able to remove the 3D printed sides um, and, and the ends, drop the tool back in, or the mandrel back in, with just this side on, and that will fit inside the rubber tool that I will have created, and then cast into that void. That's the plan of how I intend to go about casting. Now resin casting is nothing new, but it's not without its challenges, and I can anticipate a few of those in advance. So for example, if we look at this coach side, the, um, the rail above the windows is very, very slender. So what I'm going to have to do is sort of thicken this up, which will be incorporated into a little flange, which will run just inside the carriage, um, and that will help secure the roof moulding when that's finally done. Now another problem that sort of typically troubles resin castings is air included into little voids that within the within the the, the tool um, and that could be really difficult now very often casting is done sort of by gravity you have a mold you pull the resin in and, and that's that what i intend to do with these is to mount this into a sealed box so the the tool will will comprise the sides and the the base of the box but i'll have a a lid, an airtight lid that will screw down over the top. And my intention is to draw the resin from a, a separate tank or jug of resin through the mould via, um, via a vacuum system. So I'm going to infuse the resin through the, through the mould and, and I think that should help pull out the air. Um, I don't know, I've not tried it, this is going to all be a bit of an experiment. But I intend to have a mould with uh, sort of a single mandrel with the two sides formed at the same time, although they will be separated. There will be a, a mould line that runs along the two parts and they will, they will glue together and that will be necessary to be able to get the moulding out of the mould when it's all finished. I don't want to end up with the, the cast part kind of trapped around the mandrel. So those are my thoughts for how I'm going to use the sort of 3D printing to create the tool for casting these things. Now, I'm, I'm not quite at the point of casting yet. I've still got a little bit of development work to go, but all of the drawings for the carriage components are done. And I'm quite fortunate in that the software allows me to create the sort of the inverted tools um, quite easily. In fact, I could do this the other way round. Um, and cast them kind of from the outside in rather than the inside out if, if you get what I mean. Um, but that's what I'm going to be doing over the next few weeks but I thought I'd create this video to sort of talk through what my thoughts are um, because I'm quite certain there's, there's people out there who've either done something similar or, or have some experience um, and if you do then please let me know in the comments I'd be really pleased to hear from you. Well, there we go. I think that wraps it up for today. This is, video's gone on, as usual, far too long. Um, but there's some complexities around what I'm trying to do here. And I've struggled to sort of condense all of my thoughts down into a shorter video. So I hope you found it interesting. Um, if you have, then please uh, let me know in the comments. Give it a like. Uh, consider subscribing if you, if you haven't already done so. Until next time, I'll see you soon. Cheerio.